another uh, statistician, biostatistician, uh, John Lou, who is senior lecturer here in, in Galway, and uh, runs this uh, summer school of biostats at the moment. There's any place is still available. Please come inside. One but, or two. Uh, One or two. Uh, I think it's a very, it's a very, very good course. Uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about the dark arts of um, sample size calculation in a randomized trial. <coughs> That's, a, that's an amazing intro, uh, <clears throat> the dark arts, I like that. Okay, what I wanted to do uh, over the next 20, 25 minutes was not to go through all of the theory behind sample size calculations. I'm going to try and recreate the conversation that you will have when you come and collaborate with a statistician. That's the easiest way to do this. So you'll be armed in some sense with what information you need to bring and why. Martin made a call out earlier about uh, p-values. We're going to run a trial in here for about two and a half minutes just to try and demonstrate some of the decisions that are made behind trials. And I'm also under pressure now to work in some theology. So we'll see how far we get with that. Because I owe you, I don't know if I owe you a pint of Heineken or not. I don't yeah, know how this has gone. <laughs> okay, I do. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about hypothesis testing, a sample size calculation. Notice it's the word sample size calculation. It's not power calculation. Okay, so we're calculating the sample size. We're not in, we'll talk later on as to what I mean and the difference there more to do with what you need to provide. And this is the idea that you are not trying this on your own. Absolutely, let the software do the thinking for you if you like. You might find it better, as Erica and Francis had said, is consult a statistician early. We like this stuff. Some tips and tricks and some do's and don'ts. And then I got under tr trouble as to how you spell do's and don'ts. Big argument. I looked up an n-gram in Google. And the two that seem to win are do's and don'ts and no apostrophe here. Martin is a champion of greengrocer apostrophes. <coughs> He didn't like that. That's the uh, eats, shoots, and leaves version. So anyway, so before I get called up on that, so the sample size, the, the question that's here is a, a, how many subjects do I need? I mean, that's the crucial question here. What often happens is this is the thought that comes in, and this is usually judged by the budget. It's how many will I get away with? Okay, so there has to be, so there's going to be tensions between what the statistician is saying, given the design you have dreamt up, and the question you're trying to answer, here is the science behind that. This is the budgetary side. Yeah, that's all well and good. This is the amount of money I have, so what can I get away with? Okay, so the, uh, uh, the problem here is you have to guess. It's a circular argument. You have to provide some answers, uh, that you, some of the, the answers you think you're going to get as part of the process to be able to answer that. So this is where you probably mentioned the dark art. And this is, yeah, yeah, but that's not so much the dark art. That's just trying to use your inference before you, uh, uh, you start the trial. Okay, so determining sample size. So the calculation itself, there are some important steps in here. These techniques for calculations are described everywhere. Calculating these can be complicated, especially by hand. As part of our training, we would do all this by hand. This is now all done using software. But that, in some ways, hasn't made things so good because there's this idea that we can just use the software. Again, let the software do the thinking. Fundamentally, in any design, there's going to be some hypothesis test. You're going to make a decision based on limited data. So I'm going to give you, here's my first my pitch now, a theology. Every day we live trying to make this particular decision in our head. Okay, we, we're going to decide there either is a God or there isn't a God. And the way we live our life is we're going to make a decision. Do we think there is a God? I'm giving none of my own uh, um, personal beliefs here. I got in trouble with this. An American student wrote a two-page vitriol letter saying, anyway. So I'm giving none of my own. <laughs> the point here is you're going to make a decision. Two of these decisions are correct, two of them are incorrect, and I want you to decide what it means to make the incorrect decision. So the reality here is, this is think of this as the population, this is the reality, there either is a God or there isn't. Population meaning that if we had all of that information available. What you have is your own life, and based on that limited piece, you have to make that decision. So one is what? There is no God, and you lived your life saying there is no God, that's the correct conclusion. There is a God, and you said there is a God, that's the correct <laughs> conclusion. I then asked the class, this large class, to write down the consequences of making the wrong decision here. So I want you to think yourself as to what making the wrong decision, what might that mean? I'm not going to ask you to shout this out. I got them to write it down. I'll summarize what they said. So if there was no God and you decided the wrong... Now, that, that I think is unfair. It probably gives us, I mean, it will give us a good spiritual moral fiber. This time wasted in church gives an idea of what the undergrads think. What about this side? There is a God, but you decided to live your life by saying there's none. Yeah, so I got that. So I held back. There was one burn baby, burn came back. In. But, so the problem here is there's two different errors we're going to make, and the seriousness of the error depends on the situation at hand. 
So then think about it, what happens when we run a trial? This could be a classical trial where we're looking at the effect of a treatment. The treatment either works or it doesn't, and you're going to make a decision based on the study, whether it works or it doesn't. What's the consequences here? Again, they're the correct conclusions. What does it mean if you make this particular, the treatment was effective, but we missed it? Here, the treatment wasn't effective, but we claimed it was. Martin gave me these, de these definitions earlier with type 1 and type 2 error. So which of those two is worse? Some might argue, OK, if the treatment was effective and we missed it, you'd hope the treatment that's in place, standard care itself, is fine. We've missed it, so maybe that's not such a bad error. Maybe it's worse to replace the standard treatment with one that wasn't as good. So you're going to have to weigh those two things up. And statisticians then are going to give these definitions. This is like false positives. We claim something has happened and it hasn't. And being statisticians, we're like Greeks. So there's the symbol for that. So we're going to have to penalize that in some sense. And this is that particular error. What's the other error, the type 2 error? We've missed it. It actually was good, but we've missed it. So again, you're going to have to try and decide. So part of this conversation is you're going to have to say, OK, if I'm going to make this error, I want to penalize myself against making it. Think p-values. This is getting into this space now. Martin asked about 0.05. Where did that come from? Fisher in the 20s. And I'll demonstrate that in a second. Error here, you know, I mean, I want to, what I'm hoping to do here then is not make this. So that's an error. I don't want to make that error. That's my power. OK, so this is the power, which is saying that I would like to be able to identify a treatment effect if it was there. The other error is, OK, if I'm going to claim there is a treatment effect and it's not there, I really want to make sure that doesn't happen that often. So this is the trade-off that we have to have. Now, the problem here is we're going to have to make a call on this significance level. And the standard call is what? So what's the standard value that's used here is some evidence that, you know, it looks now like beyond reasonable doubt or whatever. Five. Right, 0 0.05. Where does that come from? So Martin asked that. So I'm going to run that trial here now. We'll try and come up with some objective way of doing that. It's a subjective call. This is the coin that Seb Blatter is going to use for the World Cup in <laughs> Qatar. It withstands temperatures to 50 degrees. Okay? <laughs> and you have to decide now whether you think this is fair or not. So I'm going to toss the coin. And I'm going to call out the result. You have to decide this is fair. First, tri first trial, or first observation, head. 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 OK, right. So what has happened there? What was the chances of getting a head first go? A half. What was your chance of getting two heads in a row? A quarter. Head a half by a half. Three and eight. Four. Sixteen. Right. Five. You made no noise here. You started to make noise here. You started giving out around here. <laughs> so somewhere between one over 16 and one over 32, one over, that's like what, one in 20, not point not five. You decided, show me the money. This isn't making sense. This doesn't look like it should be happening. So that's kind of some of the rationale behind why not point not five is chosen. It was very much a subjective call, and that was it. For some reason, we get upset when we see things happening about one in 20. We start saying, that doesn't look. You're assuming that it's a Oh, yeah, I'm just making this up. I'm purely using this. <laughs> right. So we now have the uh, 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 we now have the notion of power. So power is what correctly identifying. If we're going to reject that null hypothesis, we want to make sure we're doing that correctly. So have we the ability to be able to detect a treatment that's really there? If we're going to make a call that's there and it's not there, make sure that only happens rarely. So these two numbers have to be defined. The convention is this, this significance level 0.05, and the convention for power is not 80, it's at least 80. <coughs> so these two things are going to have to be provided. Martin talked about the choice of power for non-inferiority, and that tends to be more. OK, so what do you need to provide? You're going to have this conversation with the statistician, and he or she is going to say, well, what are you trying to detect? What is the effect that you're trying to detect here? Now, this should all have been thought out beforehand. I'm putting in a new intervention. I'm hoping to reduce something or raise something by how much? So it's either the difference in means, it could be the difference in proportions. What is it you're trying to detect? This is decided a priori. An estimate of variability. If you're going to detect a change in some system, you'd want to know how variable that system is at the start. So you're going to be asked to provide information as to what's happening under the status quo, the significance level and power. So we've <coughs> talked about those two. 
So what is this effect size, a clinically meaningful difference? So you have to decide. This all sounds very nice. Okay, I think that if I'm going to put in this intervention, I should, any change in, say, a cholesterol-reducing drug, I'd want to see what? A half a unit reduction before that's worth taking on? A quarter of a unit, one unit, whatever. This is determined by the science. An estimate of baseline variability. So where are you going to find this? Published data. That's probably your best bet. Historical controls. There may be some information from previous trials you could get access to. And the key part, which I have in bold, is a pilot study. And I'll come back to that in a second. These two. I put a little question mark here. This isn't definitive. In, you know, 0.8, that's what's suggested. The idea for a statistician is that or more. How do you get at this information? If I asked you to estimate the average rent paid by first-year NUI Galway students, you'd probably all say average weekly rent, 80 euro. What's the standard deviation? That's hard. So people can measure middle, but they find it very tricky to try and get at a standard deviation. So how do we get an estimate of middle? Look up any other papers, anything graphical. You've got some kind of histogram. The point where that histogram would balance on your finger is the mean. You'd hope if they gave you the histogram, they gave you the table of summary statistics as well. A box plot, be careful, it would give you the median. But if the symmetry in the box plot, then the mean and the median shouldn't be so far off. So we tend to be good at estimating middle, but very not so good at estimating variability. So what will the statistician, he or she, will say? Okay, give me what you think is the middle, and give me what you think is an upper and a lower bound here, a min and a max. And if we can argue some degree of symmetry, you might say, well, the mean plus or minus three standard deviations should give me everything. So we tend to start dividing the range you've given us by a quarter or a sixth, just to get some idea. In our head, we probably double it then, because we don't believe the estimate you've given. <laughs> and this is the key part. The standard deviation is going to be the key for your sample size calculation. So anything you can find to get at that would help. Invariably, the trial you're looking at is a change from something. And then we have these conversations, and I say, what's the estimate of baseline variability this? But I say, you're interested in the change. What's the variability in the change for the control arm? And you go, how am I supposed to know that? I can give you the befores and the afters, because that's what that previous paper gave me. And I'll say, I don't want the before and the after. I want the differences and the variability of the differences. And then you feel like emailing back the authors of the paper going, the one thing you needed to give here was that, and you didn't. <laughs> OK? But you have to provide it. Now, there are some ways to guess at. There, there's some ways the standard deviation of the change is related to the standard deviation of the before, but you have to have the degree of correlation between those two measures. But now I'm saying, great, we can get away with it. You can give me this, but you have to give me something else. And that's like saying you have to give me this anyway. So the point is, this becomes tricky. So anytime you're writing a paper, realize that somebody else is going to need those observations. At least put them in as a supplement. If you're interested in comparing a categorical response, it's going to cost, and cost a lot. I've just looked at differences between two proportions, magnitude of 5 up to 40. Look at the difference in sample sizes. To detect a small difference in proportions is going to take a phenomenal sample size. To detect a large difference, now Martin has a lovely line for this, he calls this a penicillin effect, which is all of a sudden, well, maybe a 40% difference, that could happen. And you say, you're joking me, there hasn't been an intervention since whenever that's picked a 40%, but this is the sample size that the person prefers because of the budgetary constraint. So what you often try and do here is, can we find a continuous response that maybe give us the same measure, some kind of surrogate? Let's not look at type 1 diabetics in control against not in control. Let's look at a change in HbA1c. Can we, can we, in some ways, replace that categorical variable with a continuous measure because the sample size will be considerably smaller? So think about it. Pilot studies. There isn't any trial that you could ever run that isn't going to benefit from a pilot study. So a pilot study is going to replicate what it is you're going to do. You can try and depend that historical controls and previous research would help Fine, but there's a huge leap of faith here that these individuals are exchangeable between your trial and the trial that was reported. External pilot studies means any pilot study that, where the data has been collected but it's not going to be used as part of your trial. There's a big push now saying, why not have an internal pilot study? Why not collect some data as part of your rolling out of your, uh, your intervention itself, like a seamless design? The statistician then can bring in some kind of adaptive piece, some interim piece where they say, now let's reevaluate the sample size here. Let's see, based on the estimates you provided, are we anywhere close to the, the, the is the reality anywhere close to the estimates you've given to have the sufficient power? 
So that's nice. Your pilot study becomes part of your trial. The problem is, usually there's been so much arguing to try and get the sample size so small, the last thing that you want is a statistician to relook at it and say, guess what, you actually need more. And then you say, but I haven't got the budget to do that. Then there's an ethical call. Do you say, is it worth continuing this study or not? From a commercial perspective, that's what would happen. A kind of a call in futility. From an academic-based trial, that never happens. There's this notion that things will all get better as we keep running and forget about that, it'll all be fine. <laughs> okay. So here is a proposed design. This is the kind of design you may have had in your head. You could have lovely analogies here where your sail power is essentially your power. That's like the power of this particular trial. Here's all the design components. You can imagine this beautifully designed trial with not a sufficient sample size. That's having that lovely Volvo Ocean Race boat with no sail power. Okay, what would the pilot study for that look like? That's probably a good pilot study for that. We have a similar design, similar sail shape, whatever. How we get all of the information I need to run that trial from this. What happens in reality in the meetings that we have, in the collaborative meetings we have, is this is the kind of trial that people are proposing. I'm going to write this wonderful trial, catch all, it's going to do everything, it's going to be amazing. And we help design that. And then we say, we want you to run some pilot, yeah, yeah, run a pilot trial, okay. For this particular design, yeah, can you show me what you've got? And this is, and this is, so this is often the most amount of information that's given. And the idea is, did you run a pilot study? Yes. Is it any way possible that it may be able to do that? No. But it's, no. Okay. The examples I've been given are around the randomized control trial. Now, there are some extensions to this. So Martin talked about non-inferiority trials. And I know we have some uh, people here from the medical device industry. And this is the world that you often live in, in that you have a, a device that, okay, whether it's going to beat the other device in terms of, of a, um, efficacy, that's questionable because a lot of the hard work has been done. But it might beat it in other ways. It might be cheaper, it might be lighter, it might be uh, easier to implement, whatever. So you may want to show that you're at least as good as your competitor. So now you're in the world of the non-inferiority trial, which you're going to have to provide this non-inferiority margin. You're allowed to be as good as your competitor or a little bit worse. Some margin of clinic that's clinically meaningless. So this becomes the trading argument that we have now as to what the choice for that margin is. So it's an extra piece that's added in. Cluster randomized trials, you're going to have to talk about how similar the individuals within the cluster are. And this is going to bump your sample sizes up. Imagine 10 clusters and everybody in the cluster is identical. That essentially means 10 people. Repeated measures become tricky because we are on correlation over time. OK, so I'm going to finish with a couple of don'ts. Don't, this is mainly for the psychologist, don't specify t-shirt effect sizes, small, medium, and large. OK, you specify it in the magnitude that's clinically important. That's decided beforehand, not this. Don't engage in sample size samba. Don't use software and keep plugging in values over and back until you get the kind of sample size that you like. <laughs> that's called reverse engineering. So that's letting the software do the thinking. Don't put statistics before science. So the science comes first. Then as a consequence of the science, a statistician, he or she will help you design that study. You don't put in the values that you want that gives you the sample size that you think you need because that's what you can get away with. Don't blame the statistician. We get so much, oh, I went to see that guy, and he said I needed 300 and something people. I can't run a trial with 300. I didn't. You said that because you came in with this is the trial that you want to design. We're saying to do that, this is what you need. Okay, so the final side, the ends justify the means. All methods depend on these complicated mathematics that hide the assumptions, hide the fact that they're based on assumptions whose justification is tenuous, to say the least. This is the circular argument. Remember that any study that you carry out will, in future, be somebody else's study that they're going to use these information for. You're going to have to share that information, make sure that you represent this stuff, or that whatever summary statistics somebody else might need, give it to them. Don't underestimate the usefulness of a pilot study. Knowledge is power. Thank you.